Okay, everybody, uh, we've just hit the record button, so we are going to begin. Uh, before we do, we'll take a quick tour around the Connect meeting room on the screen in front of you. Please note uh, that we've now turned on the recording function for archiving and playback through the CIDR website, cider.athabasca.ca. Uh, you are now being recorded. Beginning in the top right, you'll find a list of participants. We have a good crowd here. Note in particular my name, Daniel Wilton, under Hosts. If you hover your mouse over my name, you'll see a pop-up allowing you to send me a private chat message. If you run into any technical issues during the presentation, feel free to send me a private message and I'll try to help you out without interrupting the flow of the presentation. Below the participant list is the chat area. Note that the chat is public and is recorded. It will be included in the archived version of the presentation. Here you can post comments and responses to some of the more informal questions that might come up during the talk. It's also an opportunity for the microphone shy to post questions in the Q&A after the presentation. The main window is of course the projection screen for the slides and above that you'll find a button showing a little person with a raised hand. That is a pull down menu with options for making the session a bit more interactive. You can give a smiley, applause. If you have a question for our speaker, please raise your hand and we can see you. After the presentation, I'll release the microphone and open things up for a Q&A. A new button will appear next to the little man and you can grab the mic walkie talkie style to ask your questions. And here we go. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us online for another CIDR session. Today, we switch gears a bit for an update in our ongoing series of Dr. Michael Barbour's reports on the state of the nation in K-12 distance education across Canada. The primary and secondary levels have, perhaps, received less attention in distance education research than their tertiary cousin, but our speaker today has been there, in the classroom, on the web, and in the district. He is now an assistant professor at Wayne State University in Detroit with a PhD in Instructional Technology and a recent certificate in adult education from St. Francis Xavier. But his background is rooted in the secondary level and his research focus has been on rural K-12 students learning in virtual school environments. He has been a teacher at Discovery Collegiate and director of the Center for Advanced Placement Education where he provided advanced placement courses to secondary students at his own school and throughout North America in an asynchronous web-based format. Dr. Barbour's success with the Center for Advanced Placement has drawn international attention, and he was invited to extend his work in the U.S. through the Illinois Virtual High School and worldwide through St. Brendan's College. For us here at CIDR, he has been a loyal contributor generously offering us an annual update on the state of the nation in Canadian K-12 distance education. While he may have been adopted by our friends to the south, once a Newfoundlander, always a Newfoundlander, and his attention is firmly focused on what we continue to do up here, the changes, the growth, and hopefully some increasing sophistication of our distance education programs across the provinces. I am now passing the microphone to Detroit, to Michael Barbour. Note also that today's slides are posted on our site at cider.athabasca.ca. Feel free to use your applause buttons here. Everyone, welcome Dr. Michael Barbour. Thank you, Dan. Uh, I appreciate the introduction and uh, listening to some of that. Actually, it seems like a lifetime ago because uh, I've just finished my fifth year here at Wayne State, which is in downtown Detroit. Although for those of you that know me, you know that I actually live over on the Canadian side of the border in Windsor. Um, and prior to that, I actually spent four years at the University of Georgia uh, doing my doctoral program. So some of that K-12 stuff that you're talking about uh, is a decade old now. And it, 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 like I say, feels like a lifetime ago. Well, welcome everyone. Um, I guess a, a couple of things that I'll mention up front. Um, feel free to to ask questions as we're going through. Um, you know, this presentation is going to be similar to previous updates I've given you from this study. This is the fourth year the study's taking place, uh, and it's the third cider session I've done. Uh, we didn't get to the second year um, because of a scheduling conflict, uh, but the other, uh, each of the other years uh, we've presented on and. Uh, uh, I, 
thank uh, Dan and, and Terry and the folks at Cyber for uh, their continued support of this initiative because it's uh, getting the word out about this that I think uh, you know helps because uh, you know each of the provincial profiles are developed by people that um, you know the information is provided by people that essentially know what's going on in the provinces and in a lot of cases they know what's going on in some of the neighboring provinces but it, it's really being able to extend it particularly beyond the k-12 environment that uh, I think is really where the benefit of the project has had it, its its greatest impact uh, so I thank all of those folks that aren't in the k-12 environment who are joining us today and and cider for continuing to do this um, Basically, these are the first three reports, and, and I apologize that uh, when I was doing my slides and going through them initially, I just mentioned to Dan that I noticed that I included the wrong slide in here. So you would have seen a fourth cover in here, um, and the top would have been gray, and, and the sponsor icons on the bottom would have been slightly different. But uh, these are the first three years of the study, and um, the fourth one, like I say, is gray, and they are all available on the INACO website, um, and I've got the URL for that coming up. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the sponsors that uh, make this, this study possible every year. Uh, Connections Academy has been a sponsor uh, from year two right up until last year. Uh, we've just discovered that they will not be uh, continuing with us, so I'm sad to see them go. But in all honesty, uh, particularly that second year when uh, we really expanded the report, uh, they were our only sponsor that year, and they've always been our most generous sponsor. So I, I want to thank them, along with uh, Heritage Christian Schools, we run an online program in British Columbia and Digital Inc., um, which has actually been kind of interesting because you know, two of these companies are based in the U.S., and that's been roughly consistent throughout. Uh, it's been a lot of American sponsorship we've had for this particular report, uh, which is starting to change for the coming year, for the 2012 edition. Um, looking at, uh, I guess, where we've gotten the, the information from, one of the things that I'm, I'm happy to say um, about this year's uh, report, or the 2011 report, which was released in November, is the fact that um, all 13 ministries of education or departments of education across the country officially participated. Um, in some cases, I've had contacts within the department or contacts that were close to the department that were providing information, but because of the um, I guess the, the bureaucratic channels that are generally required to responding to research requests. In some cases, some of the ministries um, have had difficulty participating in each and every year. Uh, so you'll notice in addition to the ministries of education, we've also involved a lot of key stakeholders to find out additional information, as well as document analysis, because a lot of the provinces do provide a lot of information available on their websites. Um, so I guess to give a... a an update as to what the regulations look like across the com country. And I'll do a couple of national slides here first, and then we'll go province by province about what things are looking like. Um, this is sort of your national overview as of November 2011. I say as of November 2011 because I know some things will change from time to time. And in fact, um, uh, you're starting to see some changes in a couple of provinces that will be reflected in the 2012 report that will be coming out. Um, but in a couple of cases, like in Nova Scotia and, and British Columbia, there's a specific legislative regime. Now, in the case of Nova Scotia, it's actually through the agreement that the Nova Scotia Teachers Union has with the province. Um, in the case of BC, it's actually uh, pieces of legislation. Um, you notice Manitoba, and, uh, Ontario, and Nova Scotia, um, while it's not legislative policy, it, it's policy that's generated by the Ministry of Ed Red Education that sets out regulations um, as to how uh, things are supposed to operate. Uh, you'll notice the, the most consistent thing there, and you see this applies to Newfoundland, Quebec, Alberta, and Saskatchewan, is that uh, these jurisdictions really have no actual provincial policy when it comes to how K-12 uh, distance education is governed, which basically means that the distance education system has to sit on top of the regulations that operate for the brick-and-mortar environment. Um, and then the three territories and Prince Edward Island, uh, for the most part, have under memorandums of understanding with other provinces for the operation of their distance ed. Although in the case of uh, Prince Edward Island, there are a couple of ministerial directives that sort of set out who can be distance ed providers in the province. Um, so as you can see here, I mean, the, the regulations vary significantly across the country um, in terms of the type and even ones that have similar types of, of regulation, how that's operationalized. I mentioned BC and Nova Scotia as one example. Both had legislative 
regimes, but one uh, was set out as you know very sections of the Schools Act and the Independent Schools Act in the case of British Columbia, whereas in the case of Nova Scotia, it's actually in the uh, agreement that the uh, government has with the Provincial Teachers Association. Um, one of the interesting trends that we still see across Canada that isn't typical of our counterparts to the south of the 49th is that there's still a fair amount of print-based delivery, uh, particularly once you leave the high school and to a lesser extent middle school or junior high levels. So at the high school you see a lot of online learning that's happening, at the middle school it's still mostly some form of online or web-based delivery, but once you hit the elementary grades there tends to be a fair amount of print-based or correspondence-based material. Not saying that there isn't correspondence material at the, in, high, in um, the high schools as well, but um, there tends to be a much more print-based than what we see in many other jurisdictions, um, at least in, in Europe and, and North America. Um, when you start moving into places like Australia and New Zealand, we're actually quite comparable to them in terms of the amount of print-based activity that's happening. Uh, the other thing that you have happening in Canada that I think is interesting, uh, particularly compared to our American uh, cousins, is that we have a much more synchronous uh, online learning that's happening, whereas in the United States that's actually rarely occurs. Now part of that is due to local control of education in the United States. Uh, so here in Michigan, where I'm coming to you from today, we have 586 school districts. So in order for a state-based program to have a synchronous session, they would need all of the 586 school districts that happen to be participating in their online program to have a common start time, a common end time, a common length of period, a common recess time, a, you know, a common lunch period. So that way, you know, if they want it to run a synchronous session in period two, they know that everyone starts period two at 9.42 and, and ends at, at 10.40. You know, we can do that a little bit easier in Canada, particularly in some of the smaller jurisdictions um, or less populated jurisdictions, whereas in the states they aren't able to do that. Um, and in terms of, of actual numbers, there was uh, just over 210,000 students um, in Canada that took one or more online classes in the 2010-2011 school year. Now that is an estimate. Um, the vast majority of provinces don't actually keep hard statistics on this, so it's very difficult to actually get a sense as to the exact numbers in some of the provinces. Um, in some jurisdictions, uh, the numbers actually come in uh, significantly after the school year is out. Uh, one in particular that I can think of where if you want to get access to the number of students in, say, this school year, 2011-2012, that took an online course or a distance course, you've actually got to wait until January 2013 in order to get statistics on who learned online for the school year that began September 2011 and ended June 2012. So essentially you've got to wait almost eight months after the fact. Uh, so the numbers are a little bit difficult, so that's sort of our best estimates uh, based on the numbers that they've actually had and their growth or decrease um, over the period of time. In terms of, of how the online learning or distance education is being implemented across the country, again, and this is sort of the nat last of the, the national slides, um, essentially this is kind of the, the model that, that we're seeing here. So you're seeing um, a couple of provinces, particularly um, Nova Scotia, or sorry, New, New, New Brunswick and Newfoundland and Labrador that have a single province-wide program. Uh, again, this is for the 2010-2011 school year. Um, I'll note that in Nova Scotia, that's actually changing. You notice they're in purple now, which means they have a, a provincial program, but also some district-based programs. Um, as of this past September, that has changed, and they basically just have provincial programs now. So in the 2012 report, when it's released in the fall, um, Nova Scotia, for example, will turn from purple to red. Uh, but you'll see the, the, I guess, most common one are jurisdictions where they rely primarily upon uh, district-based programs or multi-district programs um, in some of those instances. Um, there are a couple of provinces that still have both provincial programs and some district-based programs in operation. 
and um, the territories in PEI are both using programs from other provinces, although you'll notice that um, the Yukon, the Northwest Territories, and while well, you can't see it that well, PEI have kind of a striped green going through them, and that's because they do have limited um, internal programs. Um, in the case of uh, PEI, it's actually a legacy program that they're trying to get rid of. In the case of the other two, they're internal initiatives that they're trying to grow. And we'll talk about those as we get to the individual jurisdictions. So I guess looking across the country, I'm going to, you know, being a native Newfoundlander, I always start in the east. Um, so with our youngest province, we've got uh, online learning actually has a long and rich history in the province. And not just online learning, but distance education, uh, going back to the days of the Tetra Telemedicine Center that they um, used to do a lot of K-12 distance ed um, using the old audio graphics or telematics uh, technology. And um, specifically in the, the French as a foreign language, French as a second language, and in the math and the sciences. Um, there were a number of district based programs that were started around 95, 96, that um, basically the, the proponents of those, the leaders of those programs, um, were brought together to create a, a single province wide program called the Center for Distance Learning and Innovation in 2001. Um, as you saw from the national slide, there are, uh, is no actual policy for online learning within uh, the provincial government, although that specific program um, is housed within the Department of Education, although it's physically actually housed um, on the campus of Memorial University, um, probably fairly close to actually where my DELT um, attendee is located. I think you guys are just down the hall from each other if you're up in the, the main area offices and not down in the basement offices. Um, and for the last four or five years, um, they've had actually a fairly consistent rate of about 1,500 to 1,800 enrollments, and uh, that represents about 1,000 students. So you'll notice that um, most of the students, or at least half of the students every year, and, and um, most of the students, up to 80% of the students, take more than one course through the CDLI. Uh, primarily used in rural areas, although you're starting to see it um, used more in urban and suburban areas, uh, largely as a, a solve, way to solve scheduling conflicts. Um, Nova Scotia is, is uh, moving westward, I guess. Um, online learning started in 2003 there, although like most of the provinces, uh, had a long history of distance education prior to that, uh, beginning with a correspondence program back in the teens. Um, this past September, although it's not reflected in the last report because it, it happened actually after the report went to the printers, um, but this past September, they actually had created a single province-wide program. Prior to that, um, they had a number of district-based programs that were run um, in conjunction with some of the things that the ministry were doing. Um, one of the interesting things that you see in New Brunswick is that, um, and it's the only jurisdiction where this has actually happened, not only in Canada, but in all honesty, um, I'm doing a project right now with the uh, BC Teachers Federation looking at um, teachers unions and um, how they've looked tr and treated K-12 online learning. In all honesty, this is the only place I can find it anywhere in the world. Um, in the collective agreement that the Nova Scotia Teachers Union has with the provincial government, there are 11 provisions in that agreement that look at the provision of distance education, uh, which I think is actually quite forward thinking. It's um, looking at essentially how do we ensure that teachers that are teaching at a distance have the same approximate workload and, and the same approximate quality of life that a teacher in the classroom would have. You know, so what constitutes, you know, if your maximum class size is 30 students in the classroom, what does that mean in terms of your numbers in an online class? Um, you know, what are the provisions given that distance education um, technology is always changing? What does that mean in terms of you know, required professional development um, in terms of the nature of support that's provided at the school where the student is receiving the distance education. Um, what does a work day look like for someone who teaches online, particularly if they teach 100% online? You know, it's not you're, you're in the school 8 to 3.30 and then maybe bring some grading and some planning home. Um, you know, so what does, you know, trying to get around that? And while they haven't answered all of those questions, those clauses you'll see, um, that they've got in there are an attempt to start to address those. Um, they've got about 2,500 students that have been taking courses there for the last couple of years. That's down a little bit um, in the past year, 
compared to previous years, um, and most of those tend to be in the correspondence program. Um, PEI would be the next one, obviously our smallest province. They have a small video conferencing program that's still being used. Actually, I think this past year uh, there were two students in it, one teacher and a single course. Uh, essentially, it's a legacy program that they're phasing out over time. Um, for the most part, their students are enrolled in courses that are offered uh, by the province-wide program in New Brunswick. Um, this year it was 65 students, actually I think it was 66 to be exact, I say approximately 65, I think the year before it was 44. So you're seeing a bit of increase there. As I mentioned earlier, uh, there's two ministerial directives that have been in, uh, one in 2001 and one in 2004, um, that look at how uh, distance education can be used in the online environment. Speaking of New Brunswick, where PEI gets its uh, material from, their online program, like Newfoundland's, is a single province-wide program run out of the Ministry of Education. Um, it began in the late 90s. And uh, what's interesting, actually, about the, Nova, the New Brunswick program, um, that happens a little bit in the Newfoundland program, but it's uh, of the ones I've mentioned so far, those are the only two that's happening. Um, it's used a lot by face-to-face -face teachers. In fact, um, historically, about a third of the enrollments in the provincial learning management system were actually students that had face-to-face -face teachers who were using the content as part of their classroom teaching. So essentially, they were blended students. Um, there are no specific policies for online learning, but the Ministry of Education has this, uh, I think it's a 98-page uh, manual so that these are the things that if you're participating in the distance ed program, these are things that you agree to do. So while they're not formal regulations, um, you know, they are a condition of participation. Um, the number of students that uh, participated this past year was about 1,800, which was down significantly from the previous year. Actually, it was down by about a third. So in previous years, they've been up in the 24 to 2,800 range. Um, and you know, this year there was a significant decrease. Uh, looking at Quebec, an area that's actually also seen a, a fair amount of decrease, there are um, a number of years ago, actually it's probably more than a decade ago now, um, the Ministry of Education essentially devolved the responsibility of uh, distance education to the individual school districts. And um, so what a lot of the districts have done is they've, they've essentially started cooperating with each other. And there are three main programs that they tend to be a, a part of now. Um, the SOFAD program actually mainly applies to students that uh, have dropped out of the system. So these are 16-year-olds that um, have removed themselves from the system. Um, their enrollment the previous year was up in the 44, 45,000 range. I'm not sure what's happened in the past year, but like New Brunswick, you know, they've seen a significant uh, decline. Learn Quebec, or I think it's just called Learn, actually. I've always called it Learn Quebec, but I think the official name is just Learn. Um, they are an Anglophone program. They work with a lot of the Anglophone districts. They actually have about 300 distance ed enrollments uh, that are part of their synchronous program. However, they also offer a lot of asynchronous content. And if I remember, at last count, there were something like over 100,000 students that were registered um, and that access on a semi-regular basis their asynchronous course content, either because their teacher is using it with them or because they're accessing it on their own. Um, and because those, in theory, are distance enrollments, and we're not actually sure what it is that they're accessing the content for, they're not actually counted as part of the distance ed number. But if you think about, you know, there were roughly 210,000 students in the country that were enrolled in one or more distance ed courses, if you factored in, you know, those 100,000 that may be doing this in a blended format um, through the LEARN program in Quebec, you know, that would significantly increase, uh, you know, that overall number. Uh, there's also the remote network schools, and uh, while I've uh, been a Canadian all my life, um, I'm not going to uh, attempt the, the French because I don't want to to butcher our own national language. I haven't had to speak it since my third year university of my undergrad. So, um, But the Remote Network Schools project um, is not specifically a distance ed project. It's actually a way of connecting schools together um, synchronously using video conferencing and asynchronously using knowledge form or originally CSIL. Um, so again, that would be counted as a blended learning project. So their numbers aren't actually counted in there, but there are a significant number, particularly rural and remote schools, that are um, involved in this initiative, which would mean a significant number of students as well. 
moving to our most populous province in Ontario, um, district-based programs in Ontario began around 94. And right now, for the most part, it still is primarily district-based programs that are operating in the province, although uh, there's some variations that are happening there. Um, about, I think it's a five or six years ago now, the ministry decided that they were going to get involved in the involved with online learning or e-learning in the province and created a, a, a division of the Ministry of Education or a part of the Ministry of Education, I'm not sure division is a proper title for it, um, called e-learning Ontario. One of the first things that they did was they basically took everybody's content. Um, you know, because you had 10 or 12 district-based programs that were there and they all had like a, a Math 10 program. So what the ministry did was they took all 10 or 11 math 10 classes and used that content to create a master course or a super course, if you will, um, employed a number of subject specialists to sort of fill in the holes and um, create courses for areas that hadn't been covered, and then provided that all back to these district-based programs um, free of charge to use within the program. Um, they also have a provincial uh, course management system or learning management system here in the province that uh, districts are able to use free of charge for their own distance ed programs. If you have students from another board that are enrolled in your program, you're supposed to charge them a fee, which I think is in the vicinity of about $680 to $720. It increases about $10 or $15 each year. Um, although there's a number of districts that have come together in these consortiums, like the Ontario eLearning Consortium, the Northern eLearning Consortium, and the Ontario Catholic eLearning Consortium, and they've essentially agreed that they're not going to charge each other the fees because I might receive eight extra students from some other board this year and might have nine students that are sent to other boards and next year it might be the other way around. So eventually it'll all kind of come out in the wash. Um, of the provinces I've talked about so far, right now um, Ontario is the first that I've, I've come across um, that um, actually has private virtual schools. They have three of them, the Virtual High School Ontario, um, Ottawa Carleton E School, and then the Kiwetinik Internet High School, uh, which is actually specifically an Aboriginal program in the north. Um, I see a question from Erwin here. Desire to Learn is what the uh, ministry, the eLearning Ontario program, um, has bought into here. Um, and then there's also an independent learning center, uh, which is uh, mostly uh, correspondence distance education, and they've got about um, well, almost half of the students in Ontario that are involved in, in distance education. Um, E-Learning Ontario has uh, a number of regulations that they've set up for participation. So if you want to participate as part of their program, um, you have to abide by these particular guidelines, um, similar to what you saw in New Brunswick. Although, um, if you want to do your own thing, um, you can act outside of those guidelines. And some districts have actually done both. You know, they run a program that follows some of the guidelines and then they also run a program separate to that using their own learning management system, using their own um, course content and, and outside of, of that provincial system. Moving into the, the first of the Prairie Provinces in Manitoba, the it's offered at the provincial level. You've got um, essentially the, the ministry has three programs, a, a teleconference program, a correspondence program, and a uh, web-based program. Although in the case of the web-based program, um, the ministry just provides the content and some of the other administrative items, uh, but it's the districts that actually are the ones to uh, run the programs. Um, you can see the, the numbers there in terms of enrollment. Um, what I think is interesting there is of the provinces that we've gone to, um, Ontario and uh, Manitoba are the first two that have seen significant increases. Newfoundland has stayed about the same. Uh, Nova Scotia is a little bit less. New Brunswick was significantly less. Quebec was significantly less. Ontario was a little bit more, although I think that's largely in part because we've just been able to get better information, not necessarily because there's that many more students. Uh, but in the case of Manitoba, um, particularly on the web-based side, I think that number the previous year was in the 4,000 range. So you've seen an increase of about a third of the number of students that are participating in Manitoba. Uh, on the regulatory side, Manitoba has actually been going through a review of a new distributed learning strategy. I'm actually going through a review for a fair amount of time now, and I believe that is planned either it has been recently released or is planned to be released soon. Um, so hopefully the, when the 2012 report comes out this coming fall, uh, you'll see information about that new distributed learning strategy in that particular report. 
looking at our easiest to draw of our provinces, um, Saskatchewan, uh, similar to uh, Quebec, although much more recently, and I think it's about three years ago now, uh, the province essentially got out of the distance education game. What they did was they essentially provided a bridge funding for each of the districts to either build their own capacity or to purchase capacity that had been built by other districts. Uh, so most of the districts either have built their own programs or they have um, come to rely upon neighboring districts to offer, you know, to uh, access distance education from. Uh, 16 of those districts, which are about, I think, a little bit less than half of the districts in the province, um, have come together through the Saskatchewan Distance Learning Course Repository System, where essentially it's I mean, you can go into the system if you're, say, a guidance counselor or a parent, and you can look at all of the different districts that are offering each of the courses they're offering, and it'll tell you um, what, um, you know, the format that it's going to be, if it's online, if it's correspondence, if it's synchronous or asynchronous, even what, you know, kind of course management system you're using in some cases. And it's a very detailed information, so you can actually go in and make selections about the nature of the program that you want to take through this repository um, based upon that kind of information. Um, as you can see there, they have about 3,300 students who are enrolled in about 4,500 courses. So that means that about a third of the students there are taking more than one course um, just based on, on the actual numbers. Um, Alberta has uh, got started in online learning about the same time that um, Ontario did in, in the mid-90s, actually Ontario, Manitoba, and Ontario were all second um, in, in the game in terms of the number of provinces or when they got started with actual online learning, um, both all of them in 94-95. Uh, the next province, British Columbia, is going to end up being first. Um, in Alberta, you've got a couple of different things happening. You've got the Alberta Distance Learning Center, which is a province-wide program. Um, there are a number, actually I think it's about a dozen district-based programs that are in operation, as well as um, several private um, programs that are operating as well. Um, in the public side, uh, you've got both um, the public school ones and the Catholic school ones. Uh, both programs uh, have a lot. One of the things that you're starting to see in, in Alberta um, that uh, isn't happening as much in some of the other provinces is a number of the districts have started to invest in uh, blended learning much more so in a much more systematic way than some of the other jurisdictions we've talked about. Um, I mean, think of, of, of the, actually both Calgary boards of education as, as good examples of districts that have in a very systematic way decided that they're going to get involved in, a, in, in blended learning. Um, the ministry had, has been sort of a little disjointed in terms of how it's it's gone about regulating. At present, and, and for quite some time now, it doesn't actually have any specific online learning policies. If you actually look at the secondary guidelines, um, there's a whole paragraph in there that says, you know, um, if you're going to do an online program, you need to consider the following. And, and it lists off, you know, essentially what counts as attendance, what counts as... Uh, um, you know, the, how you're going to provide support for the student, um, how you're going to provide um, access to the content for the student, the nature of the program that you're either involved in or that you're trying to create. Um, and then basically says, you know, while we don't have any regulations on this, these are things that you need to figure out before you actually, you know, really get involved in this. Um, about four years ago, they started on the road towards a distributed learning strategy and had a number of of consultations throughout the province to create a new distributed learning strategy. Uh, then about um, a year and a half ago, that got put on pause, um, actually well, two years ago it got put on pause, and then uh, about a year ago it was actually distributed learning was kind of mixed in with this inspiring action on education, which in all honesty, I have to say, is if you haven't read through this document, I'd encourage you, if you're involved in, in the field of, of online learning at any level, um, to, to read it. Because it's, it's, I mean, it uses the term inspiring in, in the title, but it really is kind of inspiring. Um, essentially, it, it's proposing a view of education where um, the manner that the education is delivered, regardless if it's in a face-to-face, 
a distributed format in online or print based or what have you is kind of seamless so that you know right now you can walk into a room and you can tell if the students are learning at a distance or you can walk into a room and tell if the students are learning from a classroom teacher the vision that's kind of outlined in this inspiring action on education document uh, in all honesty, you would walk into a room and, and you'd have difficulty trying to figure out, you know, exactly who is providing the instruction and who is just there to provide support and, and where the students are learning from. Um, and, and not just looking at the K-12 environment, but then how do you prepare teachers to be able to teach in that environment? And how do you essentially create an entire systematic change to allow for all of this to happen? Um, so it's, it's a really interesting document if you haven't had a chance to read it, and I'd encourage you to do so. Uh, having said that, um, I know that it was only about a month ago. I noticed Dan just tossed the, uh, the link to it in the chat box there, so you'll be able to find it a little quicker. Um, about a month or so ago, the Alberta Distance Learning Center um, had an evaluation of its activities that uh, was conducted, and you can pull that off of their website. Um, actually, it was probably about two or three months ago now. And then um, the, um, I guess about six months ago, the Ministry of Education in Alberta, Alberta Education, um, announced a request for proposals um, to actually come in and uh, for an outside group to come in and essentially examine the distributed learning system within the province, all aspects of it, both the actual distance delivery and the blended delivery um, to essentially give them recommendations on, on what this should look like going forward. Uh, I know that contract has been awarded. I don't know how public it has been made yet, so I, I won't say anything more about it. Other than that, I know the plan was to have it to come out. Um, the, the final reports come out about a year or so from now. Um, so I suspect that Alberta, as I've described, you know, starting with uh, that uh, policy consultations to create a new distributed learning strategy, about three and a half years ago, I suspect will continue to be in flux in terms of, of what the system is going to look like regulatory wise and, and what they're going to be pushing probably for another year and a bit. Um, moving to the most westerly province, British Columbia, the first actual online schools uh, in Canada at the K-12 level were here in British Columbia. Actually, there were two that were set up in, in the, the same year. Uh, in the 1993. Uh, at present, they have the most number of programs operating with, a, as of last year, a total of 68. Um, they also have the most number of students that are enrolled in um, a, uh, the most number of, of students that were in uh, that, uh, uh, enrolled, sorry, in, in K-12 distance education. Um, with 88,000, which I believe, if I remember correctly, represents about 13% of the K-12 students in um, British, Columbia, British Columbia, which um, is about five times what the national average is, the national average being down around 4%, I think it's 4.2% of K-12 students nationally, but in BC it's up around a little bit better than 13%. Uh, one of the reasons I think this has happened is uh, uh, not necessarily because they've got the most extensive regulation, uh, regulatory regime set up, but because funding follows the student. So if you assume that a student takes six classes in the, the run of a, a semester, essentially the student's uh, funding is carved into sixths. And essentially if you have one online program that offers the student one course, one online program that offers the student another course, and then the student takes four of their courses from a um, uh, from their brick and mortar school, uh, the brick and mortar school would get four sixth of the funding. One of the online programs gets one sixth of the funding, and the other online program gets the other one sixth of the front funding. Um, so they it's really set up a competitive model there, which is also why I think there are so many programs that have uh, proliferated there because you have essentially almost every school district. Uh, is part of some kind of online program, either running one on their own or in a consortium with one or two other school districts uh, running them. It's also, I think, one of the reasons why you see the, the high number of private programs as well, um, which would be about twice as many private programs as any other jurisdiction. Moving into the north, and I'll go west to east on these, uh, beginning with the Yukon, um, there are 
a number of minister uh, educational initiatives that they've been working on there now, um, but they also, and this is where the bulk of their students are, um, enrolled in programs from uh, BC and Alberta. Specifically in BC, it seems the Northern BC Distance Education School has a significant chunk of UConn students, um, as well as the Vista Virtual School, which is the, um, the French Immersion online program that has been set up by the ADLC in Alberta seems to have a good chunk of, of the Yukon students as well. Over the past three years, and they've played with this actually really over the past decade, decade and a half, but over the last three years there's been a concerted effort to really try to increase their video conferencing program that they've got internally. So they continually add usually about another course or so a year, um, and you're getting usually another five or six students that are enrolled in um, their video conferencing program, although it tends to still only be two or three schools that are participating. In terms of, of regulatory regime, um, most of the regulations actually come from agreements that the Ministry of Education in the Yukon has signed with uh, individual programs or in some cases with ministries of education in other provinces. Um, and as I mentioned there, you can see that you know there's roughly four, almost five students um, enrolled in BC and Alberta programs for every one student there is in a, an actual program delivered from the Yukon. Um, looking at the Northwest Territories, um, again, they're similar to um, Alberta or similar to the Yukon in, in how they operate. Um, they get a lot of their distance ed programs from or distance ed from programs in Alberta, although you're starting to see, like the Yukon, a, a concerted effort to build internal capacity, both at the ministerial level, plus some individual programs as well. And one that I will point out um, is the Beaufort Delta Education Council has set up an online program uh, that I think only had about 10 or 12 students, it might have been as many as 20 um, last year that were enrolled in it. Um, I mention them in particular because if, if there's a bunch of Newfoundlanders, actually a number of my old colleagues, including my old vice principal, who are in the district office and, and who, help, uh, who have helped set that up. Um, but like the Yukon, much of the regulation right now are through these, these provincial territorial agreements, and you're seeing a very small number of students that are actually participating here. Um, looking at our youngest territory, Nunavut. Um, it also uses programs from both Alberta and British Columbia. It is also governed in terms of regulation largely by um, uh, interprovincial agreements that the minister ha ministry has with either individual programs in those two provinces or with the ministries of education in those two provinces. Um, more so than any of the other two territories, there is a, a greater belief in Nunavut um, that um, Programs from the distance ed programs from the provinces really don't understand the context, culture, uh, relevance, and the necessary pedagogy for the type of students that you would find in none of it. Um, so because of that, they've been trying to build internal capacity, um, haven't had much success at the K-12 level. In fact, the information I got for the 2011 report um, officially, there were actually no K-12 students that were involved in any distance ed program um, in the territory, although based on previous numbers, uh, I'm not sure if that number is trustworthy. Um, but they point to programs like the, there's a, an adult-based program called Together at Distance Education, which um, I know uh, has involvement from another a number of the southern universities. And, and Terry probably might even be able to tell me that Athabasca may be one of the partners in this. I think the University of Alberta has something to do with it, also one of the BC universities. Um, but it, it, it's it's this it's a distance ed program that that really takes into account um, the Aboriginal nature of the population of the territories and a lot of the cultural uh, and contextual background that would come about from that particular context um, and um, uh, you know that particular setting in those in those particular cultures um, so it, it you're starting to see I won't necessarily say actual efforts um, but a, definitely an interest in trying to build some kind of k-12 version of these types of programs um, I guess to sort of, of clue up and, and, and leave a bit of time for some questions at the end, particularly because there hasn't been many throughout, um, 
a couple of things that I continually take away from um, this particular process is that uh, one of the most interesting ones, particularly being a Canadian that does a fair amount of work in the U.S., is the fact that um, distance education is still seen as something that we do when face-to-face -face learning is not available. You know, when it doesn't make sense to learn face-to-face, -face, um, that's when we're going to, you know, do some online learning here. Uh, you know, we can't get a teacher to teach this or we don't have enough class uh, size to teach it. Then uh, thanks, Erwin, for the link for that together at uh, a distance uh, program. Um, you know, but if there's essentially this is what we do when we can't do face to face learning. So not necessarily that it's a second rate learning. Um, you know, I know most of us here probably had some involvement in distance education, some of us much more so than others. Um, so we know that, you know, distance education that's well designed and well delivered and well supported can be superior uh, to face to face learning in, in many instances. Um, but it's it's for the particular populations that you're dealing with, you know, adolescents and children, it's not seen as desirable. It's seen as something we do when it's absolutely necessary. Um, that's starting to change a bit, but that still really is the dominant um, sentiment. And I think it's also one of the reasons why you're seeing, particularly in some jurisdictions, and I forgot to mention actually Ontario when I mentioned going through, but um, this past year was actually the first year that um, – in Ontario, face-to-face -face teachers could actually use the, the provincial LMS and the provincial course content in the same way a distance program uh, did. You know, and I think that's actually why you're seeing these kinds of initiatives happening and what you're seeing happening in Alberta with a lot of the blended learning and, and in New Brunswick as well, for example, and, and all of those, you know, those 100,000 students that are involved with the LEARN program that aren't distance students but are using the resources with their teachers, in some cases on their own. Um, the other thing that you see in Canada that is quite consistent when you look at places like Australia and New Zealand, um, but not so much, actually it's the exact opposite when you compare it to the U.S. and to a lot of European jurisdictions, particularly the U.K., um, teachers unions in Canada have been cautious supporters. I won't say that they're, they're proponents of this. Uh, in most cases, I think they're right now trying to figure out exactly what does this mean for their membership. Um, in the United States, probably quite inaccurately, you know, unions are always portrayed, and in many cases, the, the, I suppose this is the reality of the situation, as being against online learning, in large part because online learning in the States has been generally used as a way of, of union bashing or union busting. Um, you know, so when you've got something that's being used to essentially destroy you, you're going to be, uh, you know, against it. Um, that hasn't happened in Canada. Um, you haven't seen the sort of political divisions or ideological divisions um, that you've seen in the U.S. Um, so because of that, the, the unions, you know, they're still trying to figure out what this all means for their membership, but they're not against this. In fact, some are actually quite supportive of it. Um, the Ontario Teachers, uh, the Ontario Secondary School Teachers Federation, for example, in their 2010 conference, I think it was, actually passed a resolution that said that they believe that all students should have the opportunity to learn online if they wanted to. Now, not that they should be forced to learn online like they're in some U.S. jurisdictions, uh, but that they should, you know, if this is something they wanted to do, that they shouldn't be prevented from doing it. Um, that kind of ties in with this notion of, of within Canada, this hasn't become an ideological or political issue like it has been in the United States. Um, in the U.S., this online learning has really become rolled in with this neoliberal um, educational reform movement that we see happening south of the 49th, uh, whereas in Canada, the discussion around online learning has been much more measured, I'd say much more reasonable, much more um, thoughtful, uh, and, and done in a way, I think, that where it's been implemented, it's been implemented in much more pedagogically sound ways. Um, the other thing that, that, particularly as the study now is just about to start collecting data for its fifth year, um, one of the things that, that probably has made the, the greatest impact up on me is how much change and how dramatic the change has been um, throughout the time of doing this study. You know, if we use Saskatchewan as an example, uh, the first year that the study was published, Saskatchewan had a program very similar to the program you find in Manitoba, where they had a legacy correspondence program, they still had a, a 
teleconferencing program, and they were doing some web-based things as well. In addition, you had some districts that were running their own web-based programs. Um, during the course of these studies, you know, the ministry has basically said, we're getting out of the business of doing this all together. And, and you know, the districts have really stepped up and, and you know, filled that void um, to the point now that, you know, regardless of what district you're living in, you can access online learning pretty much anywhere in Saskatchewan. Um, trying to access correspondence education, which would have been very easy four years ago, it was a lot more difficult now. Um, you know, Ontario is another great example. When we first started doing these studies, eLearning Ontario had just gotten into the ballgame, whereas now they've got a mechanism that not only allows all the distance programs to access their learning management system and, and the content that they've got, but all of the face-to-face -face teachers can do this as well. So you're seeing, you know, or at least we, uh, we're expecting to see, because they won't actually have numbers on this until the end of the school year, probably even later, um, based upon the way they normally collect data, um, you know, but we're expecting to see, you know, huge numbers of, of students that are and teachers that are using this in a blended format in much the same way whereas a third of the students that are using it in Nova Scotia, or New Brunswick, sorry, are using it in that blended format. Um, Nova Scotia would be another good example where, you know, we've seen the development of new district-based programs and then all of that subsumed by this this province-wide initiative in the course of the time that this study has been active. Um, you know, so this is a front that that is continuously changing, which is one of the reasons why I always contact Terry and, and, and Dan and, and and whoever happens to be in Dan's position before Dan, um, and I guess whoever happens to be in Dan's position after Dan, um, you know, to keep updating on this because you're seeing, particularly in some jurisdictions, some significant changes. Um, if you're interested in um, the studies, again, it's inacle.org. I believe that there is actually the 2010 study that I've got linked in there. Um, I actually think if you replace 10 with 11, you'd probably get the 11, uh, the 2011 study, and you might even be able to replace 10 with 09 and get the 09 study, although they change the name slightly each year. But if you go to inacle.org and click on the research tab, you'd be able to find all of them. Um, we've got about 10 minutes for questions. Uh, there's been a couple that have been going through as we've been going, but I'm, I'm happy to uh, take any questions. And uh, Terry, um, with regards to your comment about an American consulting group, actually, I think it was a BC consulting group uh, that won um, the competition. Okay, thank you, uh, Michael. I'm going to open up the microphone to multiple speakers now. So if you do ask a question, remember to turn your microphone off. Well, I see that Bill has uh, answered a question, or asked a question already there, so I'll field Bill's first. Um, Bill asks in the chat box there about federal government policies in terms of, of First Nations. Um, there are uh, four First Nation programs that are um, operating in the country right now. Um, one is the Kiwetinik Internet High School, which is in northern Ontario, which operates as a private school. Uh, has a ministry identification number from the uh, Ministry of Education here in, in Ontario. Um, there's Credenda Virtual School, which is located in Saskatchewan. Uh, there is the Sunchild e-learning program, which is located in northern Alberta. And then the name, the pronunciation of the name escapes me. But it begins with a W. It's like W-A-S-C something or other, uh, Wasapata, uh, which is in northern Manitoba. Uh, those are the four that are currently operating. Um, in terms of the um, um, whether or not the federal government has, has any policies on this, to the best of my knowledge, they don't. Um, in fact, uh, I know. I don't know of any of those four programs that actually receive much in the way of, of direct funding from the federal government, although I could be wrong uh, with that. Um, I notice Gene has a question, he's raised his hand, as does Terry, so I'll let one of those ask and then I'll answer your questions, Erwin and Jason, as I'm addressing one of the two guys here. Okay, well, let me jump in in front of Gene. Um, first of all, I really wanted to to uh, thank you, uh, you know these these uh, 
these returning sessions, uh, Michael, I think are really valuable for all of us in Canada. You know, we have no national system, but we've got innovations that we tend to silo, and so it's really interesting to uh, to hear your uh, cross country tour. Uh, you're going to put Rex Murphy out of business in the distance ed world. Um, but my, my, I guess a, a comment first is that uh, I really do appreciate the fact that most teachers still see distance education as a second chance, but I, I was just at the Learning Analytics Conference, well, in fact, I'm about to get on a plane here in Vancouver going away from it, but the um, one thing that really struck me was talking to a guy from MITx where they're, um, you know, they're giving all their courses, and now they're allowing you to take them for not a real uh, MIT degree, but for uh, credentialing anyways of some sort. And now uh, this this morning, Harvard has joined it. And, and I asked this fellow, well, what's the motivation? Is it just to do good to the world or uh, improve MIT's name? And he said, well, those are minor reasons. But really, it's so our face-to-face -face students can take distance education courses. And our face-to-face -face time can be uh, go back to a sort of a mentoring kind of small world kind of uh, teaching style. So I thought that was really significant when the Ivy Leagues are starting to realize that, you know, the value of online learning. And the second comment was just I heard Dave Wiley talk about the uh, uh, Utah um, di distance education school with extensive use of, uh, of uh, Khan Academy and all sorts of other resources and start to see a kind of a one-to-one -one model emerging, uh, which emerged, uh, re-emerging from the correspondence model, but really souped up. And he was displaying uh, data figures on uh, achievement that was far higher than the state averages. So I think there's a lot of exciting things happening in K-12. And uh, and I guess my only concern is, uh, you know, where are the Ministry of Education people at today's session? And I, I, I tried to email a few in Alberta Education. Maybe they're here that I don't know them. Uh, but uh, I really hope that uh, all the CIDR members will take it upon themselves to forward the, uh, the URL for this session. And maybe Dan can type it in, or it will be online. But uh, because I think it's a must uh, listen to for anybody who's in the K-12 uh, distance education okay. game. So again, thanks a lot, Michael. I guess not a co question as much as uh, two comments. Thank you, Terry. Before you, uh, Gene um, asks his question. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with David's program, the actual name is the Open High School of Utah. It's a very, very interesting program. It's the first online um, K-12 online program in the United States that is entirely based upon a, an open courseware model. In fact, uh, they're in their second year of operation, so they've got all their grade 9 and grade 10 courses that, well, the grade 10 ones will be released in the next, um, I guess, in the next month or so, uh, basically at the end of June once the courses are over. But you can actually go in and get all of their course content in there as well. So all of the courses they offer, you know, they're provided available the same way that MIT and, and some of these others have done. Um, Erwin asks, uh, what is the reason behind the funding uh, district-based programs in Saskatchewan? Um, that was bridge funding that was only given for a short period of time, and essentially it was, you know, we've always funded the province-wide distance ed programs, and we've always essentially assumed the burden of this. We're not going to do this anymore, so we're going to give you a little bit of money. Um, to essentially get you by for a couple of years so that you either make plans to create, use that money to create your own program or save that money up so you can buy space in somebody else's program. Um, so, um, you know, it was only a limited amount. I think it only lasted for one, maybe two years. Um, and it was designed specifically to allow those districts to build capacity. Um, Jason asks about if I was looking into a crystal ball, where would I see this? Um, going in terms of growth over the next 10 years. A lot of that will depend upon, um, in all honesty, regulations. If you have provinces that are moving more to, say, the BC model, where the funding follows the student, I think you'll see a lot more actual distance ed enrollments. Um, and I think you'll see that grow a great deal. And in all honesty, I think you'll see very much a, an American market where um, you know, I'm here in Michigan where we've just approved uh, removing all of the restrictions on cyber charter schools here in the state, and we've got um, ads that are now running from these companies that already have waiting lists of, you know, two and 3,000 students. You know, they're running ads to get more students to join up because for every student that joins up, the funding follows the student. So the more provinces we have moving to if that funding follows the student like you do in BC, I see the proliferation of programs. Um, and more students learning at a distance. 
if, however, you see more of a, a Nova Scotia, or sorry, a New Brunswick, Newfoundland, Ontario kind of model, where you see the, the province is basically providing a mechanism for um, students to be able to access online content and then providing high quality content like, uh, you know, these master courses that you see here with eLearning Ontario. I see blended learning growing a great deal more where, uh, you know, kind of a, as Terry mentioned, you know, the, the, the MIT guy talking about, you know, where the teacher doesn't have to worry about covering the content. You know, the content is already there. They've just got to worry about helping the students make sense of the content that's there. Sometimes that'll be done at a distance. Sometimes it'll be done face to face. Sometimes you're going to use a little bit of both in the course of a year or even a, the, the span of a day kind of thing. Um, you know, so a lot of it depends upon what the ministries decide to do and how they decide to move on the regulatory front. Um, so depending on, on where you're going to see the growth. Now, Jean has been waiting very patiently. So, uh, Jean, go ahead with your question. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Great. Um, my question, I'd, I'd like your take on, on something that I worry about, and that is the influence from south of the border. Um, a lot of things are happening in virtual learning down there, um, and some of them good, but some of them not so good. And I worry, for example, that uh, particularly uh, in the case of a lot of districts who are controlling their own establishment of virtual schools, they're starting more and more to contract with outside companies for the delivery of the, this um, content. And uh, so it's not only the, the content development, but also the delivery of it. And, and, and I don't think that they're looking at all at the long term when they do this. They're under severe economic pressure down there, which we could eventually have up here. And um, so they're making short-term decisions but as a result, they're losing control of not only the, the content, and, and, but the delivery of it. And, um, and so I worry about that, that that, that trend's going to creep up here. What's your view on that? Um, I'm, I'm more hopeful that you won't see the kinds of actions that you see in the U.S. happening in Canada, largely in part because I don't think we've really got the stomach for it. Um, you know, even if you look at a jurisdiction like Alberta, and I know a number of the participants today are either in Alberta or attached to institutions in Alberta. Alberta is the only jurisdiction in Canada right now that allows charter schooling. Um, the notion that you would essentially hand over part and parcel the entire operation of a, a school, virtual or otherwise, to a for-profit company that is based on bottom line thinking um, is it, just something that is, is really foreign to us Canadians. We, we can't get our heads around it. Um, you know, we don't have that, that uh, well, as I said, we don't really have the stomach for that. Um, you know, and, and it's not just with education. You know, basically, EMOs and, and you know, these for-profit corporations that are involved with this, this neoliberal educational reform in the U.S., they are to education what health insurance companies are to the healthcare system in the U.S. And in much the same way that in most of Canada, you know, we, we would never be able to stomach the kinds of, of things we see happening in the U.S. healthcare system, even with our current neoconservative federal government. I really don't think that, that Canadians really have that, would really put up with that, I think is probably the best way. I mean, even in all honesty, if you look at the BC model, which is, you know, where the funding follows the student, which is probably the most competitive aspect that we have within the Canadian system. Um, you know, I, I don't think that you know, there, there's even starting, particularly at, at, at the district level and the school level, starting to be some pushback on this. And it's one of the reasons why all the districts feel the need to get into the game and participate, because they 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 don't want to get left out of, of this funding race. And if you asked most of them, and, you know, I communicate with many of them, you know, they would basically rather much more like the Ontario model where, you know, if a district has a student from out of district, then you'll charge a fee for them. Or if the districts want to get together and agree that, you know, they're going to assume that it's going to be a wash, they're okay with that as well. 
Um, you know, I mean, let's face it, pro corporations and, and for-profit entities have always been involved in education. Uh, textbook companies, um, you know, Coke and Pepsi giving money to, for a new scoreboard, you know, get their exclusive rights to put Coke machines or Pepsi machines throughout the building. You know, there's always going to be that within the education system. I, I think the, the big difference is, is that there's a difference between contracting somebody for their content to use in your online program that you administer, that you run, that you use the funds for so that you make sure that 100% of them go towards something to do with the student, either getting access to content, leasing a course management system, or, or using some open source thing and, and funding the support for it. It's a very different thing to essentially hand your school over to McDonald's or hand your school over to Walmart and say, okay, here, you do it. You know, I mean, the Department of Health isn't run by McDonald's. You know, we don't allow, you know, Walmart to run the Department of Industry or the Department of, of, of Urban Development. Um, why we would let some of these for-profit corporations come in and, and have direct control over schools, uh, I, I, my American colleagues just baffle me on that front. And with the exception of a small fringe element within Canada, um, I don't think that we've got the stomach for it here north of the border. Yeah, thanks. Uh, that's uh, very encouraging. Okay, are there any other questions out there? I think we're going to wrap up. We're, uh, we're past the finish line here. So uh, thanks, Michael, for coming to give us your State of the Nation report. And thanks, everybody, for attending. I do want to get in uh, one last plug for uh, our next presentation, which will be in June. And it should be here now. OK, yes, next, uh, next month is Dr. Marty Cleveland Inns uh, from Athabasca University. OK, and thanks again, Michael.